Now, so welcome back to another episode of Fantasy Cake About Podcast. Um, my name is David O'Hara, hosting today instead of Gaz. Um, and alongside me, we have Anto um, back for the new season. Welcome back, Anto. Thank you. Thank you. And so, yeah, so we're starting back into the new season. And just before the football itself kicks off, we're starting early with, with the new guest. So we have Martin Maloney on um, with us now today, who's a referee. So welcome to the podcast, Martin. Thank you, guys. So, yeah, um, as we were saying just before, Martin, we're just kind of going to touch on, on most aspects of, of refereeing, kind of how you got into it, you know, okay. your career highlights and stuff like that. Um, so I suppose even if you want to just um, kick us off, how, how did you get into refereeing or, or what's your refereeing background? Yeah, um, absolutely. Look, at like everybody else, um, I we always dreamed of, of, of uh, making a career as a footballer when we were playing football together, but... Like the vast majority of people, I suppose I was I was a bang average footballer, and maybe that's even being unfair to average average footballers. In fairness, you know, um, my father was a referee um, many many years ago, and and it is really funny when you look at a lot of referees. There is always a, a family connection. It's it's either their father or maybe an uncle or a brother or a sister or somebody was all, already involved in refereeing. That, that brought them along. So yeah, my, my father was involved in, in refereeing for years. Um, I would have had a very strong background in, in football. Um, I'm from Edenderry Town. Um, Edenderry Town AFC is my would always be my number one club. Um, my grandfather was a founding member of the club down there and the and the soccer pitches are named after him. So it was always a, a tradition and a history of, of football in the family. Um, I suppose what, what happened was I, I had been living away and I came back home and I was living in Nace working away and, and I got a little bored and then um, I decided to to take up the refereeing considering, you know, like everybody else, I had been very vocal many, on many occasions with my opinion to other referees, how easy the job was. And um, so I said, sure, look, at if it's that easy, we'll have a go. And um, I rang up the FAI and... Um, it was a beginner's course on in Kevin Street, and um, that was it. I, I went and did the beginner's course. It was a six-week course every Friday night for six weeks uh, with a very famous referee, uh, observer, and inspector, a man called John Scanlon, and um, took it from there. Um, I was then told to contact um, the Kildare Leash Branch because the country is divided into branches, and um, you basically join a branch in your area um, it's called you. You become what's called a member of the Irish Soccer Referees Society. It's almost there is a, a union for referees, um, and it, it, it's very good. It, it's a brilliant thing to be involved in because for a young referee, a new referee, you go to your meetings and you get the opportunity to pick the brains of guys who've been around for years and learn from their experiences and throw out questions about things you might have done or how would you how would they have handled something differently, etc. So. The Irish Soccer Referee Society, from that point of view, in the branches was was great, and um, so through a, a man in Nays called Pat O'Brien, who was very very famous, a bit of a legend in schoolboys football at the time in in Nays, and Christy Brannigan, I got introduced to the Irish branch, and I've been a member of the branch ever since. Um, and that was it. I went to the branch meetings. A couple of weeks later, I was given my first game. Um, I won't tell you how it went. Um, well, I will actually. I, I had four red cards. It was a youth game over in the Curra, Curra Youths versus Clane. So that was back in 94, 95. So, you know, you never forget games. And um, is, is, despite the fact it was all those years ago. Um, and that was it. Kickstart off from there. Um, many people probably thought that would be the end of him, considering he's five foot nothing. He's just had four red cards. And, and that might be the end of him. But it was the start of a, a great career and a great experience. And something I'd recommend to anybody. And like everything else, you just get in and you start doing games and and, and, and you start to go from one level of football to the next, to the next. And um, within the branch, we were blessed with some very, very good referees at junior level, the likes of John Dewan, um, Harry Murphy, PJ Coyne. And I never knew much about League of Ireland football or international football, to be honest, Dave. Um, I looked at those guys and used to see them doing Oscar trainer matches, FAI Junior Cup matches and said, Gee, it would be great to get to there. Never ever thinking about League of Ireland or international. So my first goal was just to rise the, through the ranks within within the Kildare League. And um, I was blessed that happened. I was probably blessed that I was involved in the football in Kildare when 
Kildare Football League was very, very strong. Like one of the years, four of the senior teams made it to the last eight of junior football. So that was the kind of quality of, of junior football that was in Kildare at the time. And um, some very, very good games, some excellent top class junior footballers. And then, um, as I said, just just took it game by game and, 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 and worked my way through Kildare um, up until I was then sent on a few games outside the county. And that's where I came to the attention of, of the people in the League of Ireland, you know. Uh, just like from our experience, like different people around that we know and all, what would be your opinion of why for referees it seems so hard for the younger generation maybe to come through and be the yeah. next person? Because like looking in my own district, obviously, you know, I'm involved with KDFL. Yeah. Like we're looking at the same guys every year and without sounding bad to the guys, you know, they're getting older and older and harder and harder for them and it's the same faces and just wondering what your point of view might be on why you were not seeing that next batch maybe coming through or yeah i i, I fully I, I see exactly where you're coming from it is a problem we have in Kildare. to be fair it's 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 probably a problem we that's in a lot of areas one of my one of my roles currently uh, since i retired from refereeing is i'm an, i'm a, one of the coaches on the fei school of excellence which is obviously designed to bring bring on board young referees and develop them over a two year course. And you'd be surprised we've been involved in three schools now. So that's about the guts of seven or eight years, Anthony. And you'd be surprised at the areas that throughout Ireland in those seven or eight years actually haven't supplied a referee in that in that kind of developing category with a view to to, to progressing, be it at junior level or even senior level. Um, I think one of the biggest problems we have is um, and again, I, I think we don't do enough as a cell and, and maybe it's, it's just the way people view us. I think the biggest problem for young referees is the first season, first season, first season and a half. If we can get young referees, and when I'm talking about young referees, I'm talking about new referees, not necessarily age-wise. I'm just talking about young as in refereeing terms. Um, they could come to the game in their mid to late 30s after, playing, after a playing career. To me, they're still a young referee in, in terms of refereeing. And it's that first season, season and a half. That's that's vital that we get them through that. Um, and that's when they experience, you know, the there I said, the 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 sideline, the 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 the, the levels of abuse that was probably there during their playing careers, but because it wasn't directed at them, they probably never really heard it. It was always directed at the man in the middle. And unfortunately now they are that man in the middle. Um, and it just makes the job that little bit more difficult. Um, and, you know, you're kind of thinking, is it worth it um, to give up your time um, to put yourself through that? Um, um, and that's that's one of the things I, I think we have a responsibility on the refereeing side. We have to try and put um, structures in place, be it mentoring, be it coaching, be it a buddy system, uh, something. But to do that, you need numbers and we don't have numbers. So we're struggling with referees just to cover games without asking them to take on extra responsibilities of being a buddy to or, or a mentor to a to to you, a young referee. I also think, um, you know, as a as a society, the Irish Referee Society, we can do more to promote. Like, like people probably don't realise the Olympics are on at the moment. We have a referee out there in the in the Olympics. It's, it's probably not seen much in the media. And um, Michelle O'Neill, she's an assistant referee, and I do know she was on one of the quarterfinals there in in women's football. Michelle has been to a World Cup final, and um, Michelle has done one of the European Super Cups uh, there with a, a, a French referee. Obviously, then on, on the male side, we had Alan Kelly doing Champions League games before he left America. And within three seasons in America, Alan Kelly was referee of the year for, uh, for three seasons in a row. That's the quality of referees we have. That, that's the opportunity. Damien McGrath, school teacher from AO, you know, um, went to a, a, a European under 20s officiated as a, an assistant referee on Champions League matches. Um, I don't think we do enough through society and maybe with the help of media to promote those opportunities. Like I said, I was a bad, bang average footballer. We all dreamed of playing in cup finals um, for Manchester United or, God forbid, Liverpool or Leeds United, depending on who you supported. But, but I achieved a lot of that stuff 
as a referee. And let's be fair about it. We, you can go out on any given Saturday throughout the country and there's thousands and thousands of school boys and school girls playing football. And, and the amount of those that will make a, a career out of football is very, very small. And I'm not saying they all want to make careers, but, you know, of those that do, a very, very small percentage will make it. Whereas opportunities on the refereeing side, because the pool is smaller, is, is far greater, you know. Um, like we, we, as I said, were involved in our first school of excellence seven years ago. And one of those graduates is already a FIFA referee and was doing a European match midweek in, in Portugal. So that was in, in the space of six or seven years from graduating from school and, and, uh, and a two-year uh, uh, two refereeing program. So I think we need to sell it more and uh, encourage people more. But I do think we need to be there more to help them through that first year or two. Um, um, and, and that's important. Um, I think I think people appreciate that. As you rightly said, Anthony, it's the same faces. You might see a new face for a season, a season and a half, and then they're gone. And it's that first season we really need to get after them, mind them, protect them, and, and bring them through it um, as best we can. Resources is a big problem. I'm not trying to plead poor mouths or anything, but as I said, we're struggling with bodies just to cover games without putting extra responsibilities on them. But... I think I think I think there's a there's a bigger picture here. We can all have bits to play in it. Maybe even the media, the you know, and promote the opportunities, as I say, uh, that's out there for boys and girls. The, the opportunities for young ladies and refereeing at the moment is, is just fantastic because it's such a small pool um, of of numbers there that the opportunities for them is just fantastic. But I don't think we we sell that enough, you know. So um, yeah, I think there's there's um, we as referees can do more. I think. The FAI can do more. Um, you know, it's funny. I was talking to somebody about this a while ago, and, you know, quite rightly recently we've highlighted, the media in particular have highlighted serious cases of players, be it in GA or soccer or, or other sports, be it players or managers who who have been abused from the stand, from so-called spectators or, or, or whatever, and, and quite rightly has been condemned and, and has, has been brought to people's attention. Yes. The same reporters and media sit there to GA games and soccer games while the man in the middle is getting, you know, a, a lot of abuse and, you know, family things being called into question, eyesight being called into question, you know, um, the, you know, the things like that. And, and it just seems to be part of the game, if you know what I mean. It seems to be accepted that it's part of the game, particularly dare I say it, in, in relation to soccer and, and GA, not so much when you're touching rugby and that. They, it seems to be, you know, there's a, even at grassroots rugby, there seems to be a, a, a little bit more respect for the man in the middle. It just seems to be a lot more, like the amount of times people used to joke to me at home, well, were you locked in the boot of a car recently anywhere, you know, in reference to the, the, the poor referee that time in a GA match in Wicklow. And, and it, it, it was more as a, a joke and a laugh, but no, in fairness to that, that man that day, that, that was a serious incident. And so I think we need, everybody needs to change the, the attitude and to call it out for what it is and that it's unacceptable and it has no place in the game, not just for players, but for referees as well. You know, that would be, be my opinion on that, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said as well, Martin, like it's, it's just accepted as part of the game and it just has been there for years and it's just... <clears throat> You know, accepted. Oh well, that's just part of it. So why would we need to change it? Um, if I can, David, I I just give yeah. you a couple of examples uh, while you're there. You know, we listen to you know the t the TV pundits, and I won't pick on any of them because it literally. Could, but like even the language they use and the terminology they use is completely incorrect all the time. Like you often hear them saying after a red card, oh yeah, a reckless challenge, he had to go. A reckless challenge under the laws of the game is is a caution. A challenge that we would deem serious foul play is what we call a red card. So even their terminology is all wrong, and yet they they they, they then have they feel that they have the knowledge to have a pop at, at, at a referee. I think where a lot of abuse, even and I've gone to GA matches as a spectator myself, is a lack of understanding and dare I say a lack of knowledge of the laws by the people in the stand. And um, like two two funny incidents in my in my in my own experience. I, I refereed a, 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 a an under 14 game many, many years ago in Eden Derry before the handball law had changed where an accidental handball was no offense and obviously a deliberate handball was a free kick. So there was a handball in the game where Lou gave a free kick 
and the away team happened to be Shelburne under 14 scored directly from the free kick and after the game I was approached in a very civil manner I have to say by a spectator who was never slow at coming forward to voice his opinion to referees to say that I had made a mistake because the handball was accidental and therefore it should have been an indirect free kick, not a direct free kick. Now, at the time, the law book was quite clear. It actually said accidental handball is no offence. Now, I know we've moved on in years and but on that day, it clearly said that. Yet this was a guy who felt he could have a pop, but he didn't know the law. Um, another funny occasion, I was in Upton Park one day as a spectator. I was over in London and West Ham was playing Liverpool and Torres was playing for Liverpool. And Torres had a habit of going beyond the back four for goal kicks. So when Pepe Reina would take the goal kick, if it was dropping short, he'd come and challenge the defender to try and flick it on. Or if it went long, obviously the back four had to back up. And there was a chap called Adam Watt, who, who I've met several times since, a, a coach now as an assistant in the, in the UK. He was a top, top class FIFA assistant at the time. And he was getting... Oh, the abuse he was getting from the West Ham fans because they, they were given out that there was an offside and he wasn't flagging the offside. So there was a quiet moment in the game, and the, while there was a quiet moment, there was this lone little Irish voice said, does nobody in London know you can't be offside from a goal kick? And yet, every time for 20 minutes while there was a goal kick to Liverpool, these, these people thought that, that the, the assistant referee had no clue what he was about. And it's that kind of, you know, it, it, the abuse and everything comes from an area where it's, it's not even... I, like I remember once in a game, draw to Cork City, I, I kept my flag down. Draw had scored. Cork were very unhappy. Um, but the, the video evidence proved that when the ball was played, because with offside, it's when the ball is played. It's not when it arrives. And most fans are looking at the ball, then they see it arriving and don't realise where you're... So, um, yeah, look at it. On the Cork forum, somebody said, oh, my God, the, the assistant referee was right. He, he was onside, and we gave that man a load of abuse over the decision. And somebody just replied, F him, he deserved it anyway. Even though technically you're correct. Yeah. You know, that was the, the the attitude. So I think a lot of the abuse comes from a lack of understanding and dare I say a lack of knowledge of the laws. Um, and they just feel the referee is wrong. Whereas if you review most games, most referees and their assistants and their teams are are, are, are right in, in, in more decisions than they're wrong, if you know what I mean. So I, I think it's something, it's accepted. It's, it's deemed part of the game. It's almost what they call with certain players when they use certain words as industrial language and therefore it's part of the game. And it shouldn't be. If, if it's not right uh, for players or managers to get it, I don't think it's right for the man or the lady in the middle to be getting that kind of abuse either. Yeah, I'd, I'd 100% agree with you. But like you were saying, like it's, 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 a lack, it's, it's more an ignorance of the rules and, and kind of of the scenario that, that people would be given such abuse. Because I remember it was only a year or two ago, I think, um, when I think it was a Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher did, did a feature on Sky Sports where yeah. they went to like the referee in camp or whatever it was and like, you know, trained as, as referees would and, you know, tried out what it's like to be a linesman flagging for offside and stuff yep. and e even to you know really experienced professional footballers and you know had been pundits for a good few years at that stage as well were shocked at you know the speed of the game from from that point of view and and the difficulty of making those decisions um so like if, if two professional footballers can be that surprised like yep. the difference then in, in just a layman watching the match yep. and just flagging up being like oh well the ref is obviously wrong Recently, I was an observer. One of my duties, other duties, is I'm an observer on the League of Ireland. So I, I, I go to games, which is brilliant. Even during lockdown, when the games was on, I was able to go to games. It's fantastic just to be out and about. But I, I had to review the game to, to, to re-watch some critical decisions. And the referee had given a penalty. And, and again, going back to TV pundits, you, you always hear them saying, oh, he was last man, he wasn't last man, and, and whatever. There's no such thing as last man under the laws of the game. It's, it's, it's what we call a dog's or denying an obvious goal-scoring opportunity. But the words last man don't actually appear, but it's worked its way into the vocabulary and that. So the, the commentator, the, the referee, quite correctly awarded a penalty and sent the player off. The referee was saying, oh, I thought the law had changed, that you can't be sent off for double jeopardy. You know, uh, this is what he was referencing, it, calling it double jeopardy, like the legal thing, um, that once you give him the penalty, you didn't send the player off. And that's 
that was correct to a certain extent. It's correct where there's a, a genuine challenge for the ball. So if, if, if it's on the ground and you make a genuine attempt to tackle for the ball, but you bring the player down, well, you don't get sent off for that anymore. But this was a handball on the line. So the referee was quite correct to award a penalty and to send the player off because obviously the handball was not a genuine attempt to, to, to win the ball. So here you had a commentator who was probably being streamed out to... I don't know how many fans watching the draw the uh, um, Derry game and, and, and was incorrect in his interpretation. Um, you know what I mean? He was right to a certain extent, but it goes further. It has to be a genuine attempt to play the ball. If it's not a genuine attempt to play the ball, for instance, if you push a guy over, well, that's obviously not a genuine attempt to play the ball. So that in itself would be a red card as well. So it's those kind of things. I go back to commentators, pundits, making those comments on, on be it TV or radio and People kind of tending to pick it up and run with it and believe that when, as you said, it's not a full understanding or knowledge of the law, you know? Yeah, oh, 100%. Yeah, because, sure, actually, myself and one of the lads in work actually only had to look that rule up again recently because we thought it had changed, that you couldn't get, it, you know, the double jeopardy type thing. But yeah. obviously, when we looked it up, it's, it's a case of if it's... If it's not a genuine attempt, then you can still get red cards on the penalty. Yeah, and 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 don't forget, it's only a genuine attempt inside the penalty area because obviously the resultant foul inside the penalty area is a penalty. If you make the same challenge a yard outside the penalty area, um, and and it's a genuine attempt, but you deny the obvious goal scoring opportunity, it's now a free kick and a red card because obviously there's no penalty kick. So it all depends. A yard could actually make a huge difference in that decision as well. But um, And it's that kind of knowledge. And look, it's, it's, it's different for me. I, I live and breathe. The, I have to. It's part of my job. Look, I can't exactly go and observe a referee and, and a team and make calls or make comments or observations under performance if I don't know and understand the laws of the game. And Anthony's been to some of the presentations I do in law changes to the KDFL because Obviously, as part of my remit as the lead observer in Clare, I do that for the clubs and I do it for referees locally. Um, so, yeah, it's part of my my job. It's it's part of my involvement in the game to be aware of the laws. And, and, and ultimately, it has to be. Any referee has to know the laws of the game. It's the first starting point is knowledge of the laws. Um, and I think that's where some of the abuse comes from and some of the misunderstandings. It's that lack of knowledge or lack of understanding on behalf of the person on the other side of the line, you know? I think that's definitely one of the, the biggest issues when it comes to abuse. Like you said, a couple of workshops I've been to that you ran for the KDFL and all. And, you know, you're in a room maybe with 20, 30 guys who all think they know every single rule that's going and try and make things a lot more complicated. Then you go in and Martin's there and he's showing you the rules. And, like, you're probably correct in this, but there's not actually that many rules. No. A lot of it comes to interpretation and stuff like yeah. that. And But lads come in with this knowledge of oh, I know exactly, and like the referee maybe doesn't know, and because things have changed a little bit as well, interpretation and such and such, <laughs> like, that's one of his mindset that they know, and that's it. When you probably look at it as supporters and people who watch football, probably 90% of them don't actually know. Actually yeah, like, the like there's, as Anthony rightly said, and he's picked up there when I do my presentations to the league and clubs and there's actually only 17 laws to the game of association football. That's all. There's only 17. And like law one is the pitch. Law two is, is the ball. Law four is players' equipment. Law five is the referee. Law six is other officials. You know, you're into another law for the goal kick, another law for, for penalty and, and, and restarts and, and, and that. The three big two laws where the interpretation and the ones that, you know, is where the real refereeing is law 11 and 12. Law 11 is offside and law 12 is fouls and misconduct. But when you boil it down, there's only 17 laws in, 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 in the game of association football. And I, I think that's what people tend to get carried away and think there's hundreds and hundreds of rules, as they call them. You know, I'm a stickler for that with the referees. It's laws. And, uh, you know, there's a, there is a, only 17. And, and yet, you know, when you break it down, there's a law for the pitch. There's a law for the ball, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, refereeing, it's... And law 11 and 12 comes down to a lot of his interpretation and uh, criteria laid out, you know. Um, and I've always made myself available to clubs, not just players, but managers, etc. particularly when there's law changes, but at any time, because I think uh, if we can do that, I, I always say there's football to me, be it on a senior level or more so on a local level, it's, it's like a three-legged stool. You've got the clubs and the players. If we don't have clubs and players, we don't have a game. 
you've got the league and the administrator. So in this case, the, the Regina Casey's and Michael Casey's and, and, and Karen Hickey's in the KD, KDFL um, to administer the league and run the competitions, et cetera, et cetera. And then you've got the referees. Um, and, and no one leg is more important than the other. If, if the three legs aren't equal, the stool falls over and no one leg is more important. Each leg needs the other in order for, for it to function. And I, I think we need to get there. Um, like many, many years ago, uh, a league administrator once referenced, and, and some people might still have this mentality, once referenced referees as a necessary evil. And, and, and I, don't, I, I don't see us as that. As I said, I see us as very much an integral part of the game, but no more important nor no less important than the clubs and the players or the league administrators. We, we all need each other. Otherwise, there is no game. You know, and that's my that's my opinion. It has been for a long time. We're all important, and we all have an equal role. You know. Yeah, it's true. Um, like, like I do a bit of singing and myself, so I it's consider it's um similar to the conductor of an orchestra or a choir. Do you know what I mean? Like everyone who's looking at them again, it, it's it's very similar to what refs are. You know, if, if you're not aware of the ins and outs of it, you'd you could be ignorant for being oh sure they're not really doing much. You know, someone at a concert will be looking and they think the conductor. Well, sure, what does he even do? He might as well not be there. Sure, they're the ones playing the instruments or, or singing the song or whatever. Yeah. You know? um, where if you're then on the opposite side, you know, ask any of the singers or the musicians and they're like, oh my God, if he wasn't there, sure, we wouldn't know what to do. You know, yeah. so it's similar enough with the referee. Like, again, it's the 22 players on the pitch playing the game itself. But if there was no referee to actually legislate for what's happening, yeah. you know, it, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't flow. It wouldn't be the game of football that it is. It's funny, Anthony. I know you're you're into Germany and that. Uh, uh, I used to live in Germany, as, as you know, Anthony. And we got a club to get, we got a team together, and we we actually joined a, a local league. And this is so typical of the Germans, where there was no referee, but everybody called called their own fouls. You know, you you called a foul on yourself, or you you know whatever. And in fairness, the Germans being so honest as you would know, Anthony, and straight up. But we were a team of Irish and English, Scottish and Welsh. Like we fouled nobody at all. And uh, but yeah, I agree with, without the referee. But look, at, I I've had some great experiences down through the years. Like people talk about, you know, you always try and, and do your best. Um, did I get everything right? Absolutely not. But did I ever go out to deliberately cheat anyone? Absolutely not. Um, any decision made was made honestly in that moment in time based on the best information I had based on the best angle. And um, like, as I said, nobody could question my impartiality. I, I sent off my own brother once David after three minutes. So, you know, um, nobody can question that. Um, one of my favorite referees was a man called Paul Durkin. I don't know if any of you remember me. He was England's rep in um, the 1998. Uh, or he, he was my favorite referee for a couple of reasons. One, because he was a bit like myself. He was vertically challenged. So I like that about him. Um, and um, two, I remember uh, reading his book and he had given his brother a caution, which meant the brother accumulated so many cautions and got a fine. And the brother was in university and couldn't pay the fine. So the mother ended up having to pay whatever it was, pounds, shillings and pence or whatever it was. So nobody in the family talked to him for, as he said, for weeks afterwards. And he felt great because he'd done his job right. So when I sent off the brother, I kind of felt... I've gone one better than Paul Durkin. Uh, I just didn't produce the yellow. I produced the red card. So, um, yeah, look at moments like that. Um, fantastic. You know, uh, there, there are things we, we can talk about for, for years afterwards. And it sounds so simple compared to what I've done and what I've achieved. But it's, it's a very good memory I have, you know, football, you know, uh, especially when I met the newspapers and, and the radio. But we, we leave it at that, you know. That was back in 99. Um, so again, yeah, you remember games, you remember things, you know. Class. Um, yeah, well, as you were saying there, as you were touching just on on more of <clears throat> your actual refereeing career, um, could you tell us more of kind of, you know, as you said, you never forget a game. Is there any, you know, particular few matches that would stand out to you? Or oh, look, at, um, I, 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 on a junior level, as I said, I was probably blessed coming through Kildare when Kildare had some really, really good super teams. Um, you know, Kildare Town, Leinster Junior Cup winners beaten in another final, Castle Villa, uh, Kyle Dove, always strong, always good, um, Cara Celtic, um, you know, Suncroft, 
you know, all good sides with top, top players. But ultimately, the and, and I did outside games. I did the Interleague Youth Final. Uh, Kevin Doyle played for Wexford. Ralph Cretera was the captain of the Sligo Leitrim team. I'd done Oscar Trainer Finals. I'd done, but the biggest game I've done at junior football, and no problem saying it, is the 2012 London Cup Final. Um, if, if, you, if you're a referee in, in Kildare, that's the final you want to referee. And um, obviously, because I had gone on a different path and onto League of Ireland and international football, um, you know, that wasn't open to me at the time because it wouldn't be fair on the guys who were doing local football. But when I finished on the League of Ireland and I came back and, and was still available to junior football, I was I was absolutely over the moon. And and I, I'm not messing, people wouldn't believe it, but the honour to do the the Lumsden Cup final in 2012 and a cracking game between two very good teams, Castle Villa and uh, Rathangan. And Castle Villa won out in the end. Um, great honour. Absolutely fantastic. And any referee who has any ambitions in Clare wants to referee the Lumsden Cup final. So I was blessed and honoured to have been appointed to that. It's only the second biggest game that I remember in, a, in junior football was actually a pre-season game. Um, as I said, I'm from Eden Derry and uh, in Derry Town, tough place to go and referee. I know I was a spectator there many years, uh, doing exactly what I've been given out about. And then um, I, I refereed there and they played Carberry, which is, although in Kildare, is literally just out the road. And um, what a game. Uh, two top teams, two top fo- two full of top class footballers on both sides. Uh, the pitch in Eden Derry was packed. Um, neither Eden Derry nor Carberry do uh, friendly. So it was a uh, it was a preseason game. I never called them pre never called them friendlies. And what a game. Cracking game, pace, intensity. Uh, Carberry won 2-1. Uh, absolutely fantastic game. And then from a junior point of view, apart from all the local games and everything that stand out, I suppose the Oscar Trainer quarterfinal stands out between the AUL and Wexford because basically it was it was a trial for me for League of Ireland. Uh, the man I referenced earlier, John Scanlon, who was the lead observer at the time, came out to watch me in the AUL complex. So basically, I had one shot to to make an impression. Um, and um, thank God the game went well and um, I got called up to the to the League of Ireland. So from a junior point of view, th- those games stand out. From, from a League of Ireland point of view, from a, a senior football point of view, I suppose the, the same logic follows. You want to be involved in your own cup finals. And I was blessed again to have been assistant referee on two FAI senior cup finals. Um, the first one in 2002 in Tolka Park, where Dundalk beat Bohemians, actually came from behind to beat uh, uh, both 2 1. And uh, in 2004, in the Old Lands Down Road, uh, pre Aviva days, um, when uh, Longford, again, funny enough, came from behind to beat Waterford 2 1. So Again, when you get to the League of Ireland, when you get to senior football, everybody wants to be involved in their senior cup final. And after that, as I said, I think you might have got the hint when I was talking about who I wanted to play for as a kid. I'm obviously a Man United fan. Um, so I, I was an assistant referee when they played in the Aviva. Um, I was an assistant referee when Ronaldo and Madrid played in, um, in Tala. You know, you're talking about... You know, Man United, Real Madrid, these are names that we only seen on TV. And yet here was a guy from Eden Derry, you know, sharing the pitch with them. You know, that's what I'm saying. Dreams can become a reality as a referee. And finally, Anthony knows my my love of Germany. My last international appearance was in Copenhagen. And it was a game between Denmark and Germany, a two-all draw, which was live on German TV. So all my friends and colleagues and people I knew in Germany, we're all watching the, the game live on, on German TV. So I was under pressure more on that to make sure I didn't make any mistakes, not necessarily from the game itself, but from the people back in Germany. So, you know, th- those are the type of games and those are the type of memories I have, David, you know. But um, I could go on forever, but it's it's, it's just fantastic. It, as I say, you know, from a guy that, you know, we all dreamt of playing football, playing average footballer, I achieved the dream as a referee, and 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 that is a possibility for every young boy and girl out there. You know, if I can do it, it's it's definitely achievable for anybody. You know, hundred percent, hundred percent. Another way here. 
were talking there, Martin, about um, you know, when you get to the international stage and all, and obviously for a referee to a degree, that's kind of the highest level you can get to on the international stage and all. Did you ever find it hard, say, when you were put to, say, a game like Denmark and Germany, for example, and you're such a buzz of, you know, such and such is playing or such and such is playing, would you ever find it difficult to pull yourself back from there and say, I'm here to do a job and, you know, that's great, he's there, but, like, put that yeah. to be, no, I'm here to yeah. Yeah, look at uh, absolutely, and look at the the first thing, and and I was very very lucky again, and I had um, a great mentor down here in Kildare, a man called J P Kelly. Um, J P had gone before me on the on on the international panel as an assistant referee, and was still an, an assistant referee when I joined, and had a couple of years together uh, traveling around Europe, and he gave me great advice. And look, basically, the advice is when you go to these games. Um, you know, as I said, you're, you're talking about the Ronaldos, the, the man, you know, you go to the Germany games um, you go, we did games with Wales and Norway. Um, you know, um, we did Israel and, 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 and the Liverpool player at the time, Ben Ayoun, um, you know, all those kind of players, Jan Ar- Arnarisa with Norway. Uh, we did a game in Norway with Uruguay, Diego Forlan, Louis Swart, you know, all these names. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the attitude is very simple. We're not tourists. We're there to do a job. They're there to do a job and we're there to, to do a job. They they would not think much of us if you were there trying to get photographs or asking them for a jersey or asking them for an autograph. That's not that's not the way to do things. Like, can you imagine what 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 that tells them? Sure, these guys are only here, you know, they're not professional, they're not, they're not up to this at all. So Yes, you have to park that, and basically, you're just professional. You, you, you just approach them as if, if it was, dare I say, Kildare Town and Casa Villa coming out down in down in Mulroney Park or Bowls and Rovers in Tallow or whatever. You just have to approach it with that kind of mentality. We're not tourists. We're professionals. They're here because they're good at their job, and we're here because we're good at our job. That's that. That was how you had to approach it. I do remember being on a mini tournament, an under nineteen mini tournament in Spain. And the manager of the Dutch under-19s at the time was a chap called Rude Hullet. I'm sure everybody's heard of the guy. And what, what, he, what he liked was nobody went near him for the whole tournament, including the players of the other teams, because like, they would have obviously known a superstar like him. But once the tournament was over, he made himself available to everybody for a photograph and, and things like that. Um, we did a game in Germany with Holland under-21s, and Bergkamp came in after the dressing room after the game, sorry, um, to give us a little token for the game. And he got into a photograph. And that. So little things like that after the game is OK. But before the nearest, I have to say, Anthony, that the nearest I came, hands up, and there's no problem saying it, I've retired now, so I can say it. The nearest I came to asking any player for a jersey was in Norway when Norway and Uruguay played a, a two-all draw in a, in a friendly. And it was this close to asking Diego Forlan, obviously, um, for his jersey, considering like he'd be a hero after all those goals against Liverpool at the time, you know, uh, for all us Man United fans. But um, as I said, I came this close, but I never actually asked. But um, yeah, no, uh, to, as I said, you just have to park that. You, you're a professional um, you're there to do a job. Um, you're not there as a tourist, so that's that's the attitude you have to bring to the game. Absolutely, uh, simple as you know. Yeah, hundred percent. I'd say it was tough though when you came up with the likes of, of Forlan and and Ronaldo and stuff to to hold yourself back. Absolutely. You know, he got her, no? Yeah, the, oh, the one thing. Oh no, working from my memory, Anto. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I will say, uh, and people are missed, um I don't think cameras uh, do uh, Ronaldo any favor. Like, okay, I'm as I always say, I'm five foot nothing. I'm not exactly a big man, but like you stand in beside Ronaldo, he's a big guy. He is a big guy, and I don't think the TVs do him justice in that score. He is a big guy, and um, you know. But again, as I said, you've got the park it, and um, they expect you. Like they're professional. They're there to do a job. They they don't expect you there asking for. Now, after each game, in fairness, be it on a club or, or international level, each each team, be it club team or or uh, international team, they might leave they'd leave you in a little uh, a little token for the game, maybe a pennant or some pins, or you might get the odd jersey or whatever left in afterwards. But that would always be just a token as a as a little thank you for the game. 
it wouldn't be something you'd have went to ask for. The, the clubs or the, the countries would have given you that as a, as a little thank you for, for doing the game. But other than that, you have to be professional. Would you talk about my first introduction to football, to European football, actually, I got a flashback yesterday because it was with PA, PAOK Thessalonica of Greece, who, as we know, were in the Aviva against Bowles. Um, and I wasn't actually on the international panel. I was literally after just completing one full season on the League of Ireland, but it had done very well. So they appointed me as an assistant referee in a UEFA Cup game. And the one thing that blew me away was the pace. It, it was just like... The step up from junior football to League of Ireland football, you just can't compare. The step up from first division football to Premier Division football within the League of Ireland is is worlds apart. And then you go into Europe, and um, I always remember after about 10 minutes, it's like anything, you, you like a nice early flag to settle you. And I got what I thought was a guy at least 15 yards offside in my in my head. I, very easy. This is great. A lovely settler, you know, whatever. So in the debrief, because what people don't, don't realise is after the game, UEFA appoint an observer, a bit like an observer in League of Ireland games. There's an observer there at all UEFA games and you have to do a debrief afterwards and he will mark you and your, your marks are sent back to UEFA and that dictates whether you get a game or you get stood down for a game or whatever. So it's not just a simple thing of going away, enjoying the sunshine, doing a game and, and coming back. So there's a, a responsibility there to, to do a good job. We replayed the first offside, and I'd say, yeah, he was offside, but about by about two and a half, three yards, not the 15 yards I thought in my head. And it just shows you at that level the, the speed, the likes of Henri and Ronaldo and those kind of guys, Raul and all those kind of – their speed over that first three or four yards is, is just unbelievable, you know, to the naked eye. And that's what you've got. Like, I admire those top-class assistants, be it Premier Football or the Euros or whatever – like they're winning millimeters all the time, like, yeah, and those guys are, are moving at a different level. It, it, you know, they knock it around, knock it around, knock it around, and then it's just wham, boom, gone to the front, and, and the pace is just unbelievable. So, yeah, that kind of woke me up to to the pace that you know it, it's a different level again when you when you step up there. And uh, you know, you often hear them talking about for players the step from club football to international football. Well, it, for us as international officials, the step from League of Ireland to international football is, is a step again, you know, and uh, yeah, it, it's well worth it though, but it, it is something you have to prepare for, you know. As you were just saying there, Martin, like, you know, the... Margin of error is so is so fine. Um, with the likes of VAR and stuff having come in in the last couple of years, what's your thoughts on that? Or like me personally, you know, it, it was initially you know, you know, broadcast that it was going to be you know clear and obvious decisions. You know, the offside rule, as far as I was concerned, should really just be more. You know, the line is there. You know, and you can look it back in yeah. on the replays. But surely, if you have to be going down to to you know minuscule proportions then surely it should just be level yeah what would you think about that yeah look at um as as i said you know um for me i when they were talking about var and this is just uh, my own personal opinion by the way and um, just to clarify it's not the fai opinion or the opinion of the irish soccer referee society it's just mark maloney's opinion we there's, there's the old saying be careful what you wish for you just might get it and um i think that's what's happened with var um because people were looking for, as I said, the red card, the penalty kick, et cetera, et cetera. I've no issues with hairline technology, hairline goal technology, because that's a matter of fact. And the game doesn't get stopped. Um, I think VAR worked very well in the Euros because we didn't seem to have the, the delays that we seem to experience in the Premier League, which is obviously a division we we seen. Like the first time I seen VAR in operation, Anthony, I was at a Bundesliga game in, in Freiburg and um you know, the referee, the ball went out for a throw in. The referee stopped the throw and he made the TV signal. So I thought he was going to go over and review it. But obviously in Germany, the way they work it, it's guys are in some TV vans offside or whatever. And they just told him in his ear, no, that's a penalty. So it was kind of cold. There was no real review by the referee. It was kind of a bit of a shock. Um, I'm not a fan, I have to say. Um, I think... Um, 
And despite the fact that it did work well in the Euros, and I don't know if you're watching the highlights of the two semi-finals in the Olympics last night, but there was two penalty decisions in one in either game overturned by VAR. Um, um, uh, Brazil got a penalty which was over, correctly overturned, and they ended up winning on penalties. And Spain got a penalty which. I have to say, on my first view, and I, I thought it was a fair challenge, and, and VAR correctly showed it to be a fair challenge, and Spain scored literally with the last kick of the game an extra time to go to the final. So, you know, it came into play there. But I kind of look at it as a, not not more as a referee, but more as a spectator. Um, you know, I often ask, how, lo- how long does a game of football last? And um, people say 90 minutes. But for fans, a game could last a week because you're talking about it. And, you know... You know, oh, Maloney, that referee, he never liked us anyway. Sure, he never gives us anything. It was a dive. Oh, no, he clearly kicked them. was a penalty, et cetera, et cetera. So the fans have that to talk about and get their money's worth almost for a week until the next game comes along and, 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 and we start over again. But with VAR, it's, it's clinical. You know, the, the penalty, it's either yes or no. The, the red card is either yes or no. So... There's not an awful lot to discuss between games, uh, you know, anymore for fans. Uh, and, and I kind of look at it that way. But go back to your point, David, about, you know, it was meant to be clear and obvious and, and the marginal, there I said, the big toe or the foot offside. I, I suppose it's something I would say to referees, and, and I go back to the point I made earlier, you know, be careful what you wish for, you, you just might get it. You can't pick and choose what laws you enforce, if you know what I mean. If 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 the if that's your offside line, and and his foot is a, is ahead of it, you can't just say, "I oh, will look at it. it's it's only a couple of inches." We let that go, you know. Um, and ultimately, that's what you're into. Like I've read recently, where there, there's talk where in the Premier League, those marginal decisions will be allowed to go. But you know, now you're picking and choosing. A, which laws you're going to enforce and, and which elements of the law you're going to enforce. So almost where do you stop? And I suppose over the course of a league, for me as, as a football fan, because ultimately all referees were all football fans first and foremost, um, um, the best team always wins the league. And no disrespect, the worst team generally always gets relegated. Um, and I just wonder... You know, instead of fans talking about decisions that may or may not have gone against them and referees that do or don't like them, you're just talking about VAR and um, how long it's taken to make decisions. And, and I'm not sure, I do, particularly what I've seen in the Premier League, I'm not sure it's better the game. But as I said, from the start, I, it wouldn't have been something that I would have been a fan for. I just I just think there's that whole element. It's, it's, it's humans playing the game. It's humans refereeing the game. And it's that... It's that banter after the game. Like when you pay your 20 quid or whatever it is into a game, it's not just 90 minutes for fans. You know, a game of football lasts a lot, lot longer. You know, it lasts until the next game and we start and that becomes our focus. Um, but having said that, worked very well last night in two semifinals and I thought it worked very well in, in, in um, the Euros. My initial fear with VAR from a refereeing point of view was I thought referees might might be reluctant to make that big decision in particularly inside the penalty area and wait until they got a little billy in the air to say you might want to look at that again and that seemed to be the case initially early on but in fairness i don't think so uh since and the big example i give is uh uh Shikamina in the champions league final liverpool and spurs literally what were we a couple of minutes into the game penalty kick um and, uh, you know, he made that decision bang on. He, he You know, he didn't need VAR. And Shikamina, in fairness, on a few occasions, I've seen him referee, has made those decisions on his own. And, and that was one of my fears with VAR was that referees would tend to shy away from a big decision, waiting for someone to say, look, I think you might want to look at that. Um, I think you have to can iron it out, look at anything that can help a referee. But uh, as I say, I just... I. I you can for me. You can't pick and choose what laws you're going to to enforce. You can't pick and choose what elements you're going to enforce. So it's either there, or it's, it's either in or it's out. Um, that would be my humble opinion on it. Um, but I just wonder for fans sometimes, have we taken away that that banter over the point after the game about it was a dive, it wasn't. We it should have been a penalty. It wasn't a penalty. It was inside. It was outside. I don't know. 
I don't know. Um, but as I said, it worked really, really well in the Euros and it, it worked well last night on two occasions in two big games and two semifinals of the Olympics and quite rightly overturned two penalty decisions. You know? um, but I'd be a fan of hairline technology, absolutely, because that's a matter of fact and it doesn't stop the game because they get the they get the not they get the thing on their watch straight away. Boom. And uh, obviously going back to the villa game there a couple of things, they actually have to turn it on first. But look at that's a that's a that's a separate thing, you know. The first thing that they're gonna do in the, the English league though, man, with the handball thing, I think it's just is enough for a referee just gonna like leave a referee even more open to his interpretation <laughs> of you know like even more accidental or marginal. Yeah, like, and the, the whole handball, as I said, and i give you the example, when I was refereeing a couple of years ago where a guy came out and said to me, look, it's an accidental handball, therefore it should have been indirect, when at the time it was quite clear an accidental handball was was play away, it was no offence, and it actually stated that in the laws. Um, and then obviously they've moved, and um, what they tried to do was, uh, even if it was an accidental handball in the lead up to a goal, they felt that was unfair and that would have to be taken back. And they've gone and changed it again now that if it's an accidental handball in the lead up, it's OK once the handball or, dare I say, the accidental handball is not by the player who scores the goal, if you know what I mean. So if one of these colleagues does it in the build up, that's going to be OK. Um, yeah, look, at, and, and that's all interpretation. They do, in fairness, give referees guidelines in fairness they don't just throw it out there and say look at accidental handball is this and you know they do give guidelines about and they put videos together in fairness um, of examples of what they want and that that's what referees at all levels would see like you know the the, the, the whole idea about players making their their body bigger you know um you know a guy jumping with his hands in the air saying oh the ball hit me but your hands shouldn't be up there you know what i mean um so even though, yeah, he sticks his hands up and the ball hits off him, you know, people say it's ball to hand rather than hand to ball, but his hand shouldn't be there. So he has made himself, him, he or she has made themselves bigger by, by there. So they have, in fairness, where possible, given referees guidelines and what they should be looking for in the whole area of handball. Um, um, and then obviously now they've taken out the shoulder element that the shoulder's not part of the handball. And that, that then... It's funny enough, and you might have seen it, Anthony, in the presentation, because they've taken the shoulder out of the handball, this is no longer up here, consider handball. That then has an implication for offside, because technically now you've seen the, the, the arm hit offside, because if the shoulder is technically in an offside position, because now you can score with that, well, that's offside. Um, obviously, if your hand or arm is in an offside position, that can't be offside because you can't score with it. So, um, but obviously, when they rechanged the whole handball thing, as you alluded to, Anthony, and took the shoulder out, that then has a knock-on effect into offside. And that's that's the thing. And look, at, it's frustrating for people. Um, as I say, I could talk about this whole thing, as Anthony well knows. I can talk about it all day, but but that's what I do, and, and I enjoy it, and, 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 and that's part of my game. And But it does. I can understand how it can get frustrating for people on the other side that have to watch it and um, may not have the same knowledge or understanding that other people would have, you know. I suppose as well, Martin, just before we kind of wrap it up, um, there's one other thing I wanted to touch on. You said it um, earlier on in the podcast of, you know, the type of abuse that you'd be getting on the sidelines and stuff and, you know, having to kind of persevere in the first year, year and a half of, of new refs coming through. Um, how did you find it, as in mentally, what got you through that first period? Yeah, I, I, was just I suppose. As well as that, just kind of how, as you said, there needs to be more kind of, you know, in place for the new refs. Yeah. Um, what kind of stuff, uh, you know, is being kind of put out there to, to help new refs? So yeah, I, I suppose. Look at I. I always, I always joke, but it's, it's, it's a well, while I joke, it's a little bit in earnest. As I said, I, I grew up and I watched all my football in in Edenderry Town, and anybody will tell you, I've met 
guys who played football in Dublin, junior football in Dublin, when they say, where are you from? He'd very Jesus, we never got anything easy down there. Not an easy place to go and play football and not an easy place to go and referee. And I was one of those guys. Um, like I, I famously got a, a card off my father when I played once uh, because of things I was, I was saying to him, you know. And a bit like myself, he went through proper procedures and even asked me my name, um, which is unbelievable. But uh, I suppose nothing changes. Uh, as I said, I sent off my own brother, so we, we, we don't change in those things. Um, so from that kind of point of view, I, I, I kind of went into it half expecting it. I, I'd been there. Um, I'd, I, I'd, been, I'd gone to matches with my father. My mother used to bring us to matches as kids. She ended up having to stop because one day my sister asked her, what were the people calling her daddy? So we were getting to an age where we were beginning to hear things and whatever. So she stopped bringing us to the matches. It's funny. I remember refereeing a, a, a youth cup final in Kildare. Cracking game. Kyle Dove and Kilcullen. Two, two top class youth teams. And a bank holiday Monday once, many years ago. And my sister told me I had a good game. And she knows nothing about football, by the way. That, but how she equated I had a good football, I, I had a good game was... She said there wasn't too much abuse shouted at me. So that was how she equated. And it goes back to, I suppose, the fact that we've accepted it and it's part of our game. Um, yeah, look, at my my father from, from the very, very start always said to me, don't worry about the line. Never get caught up in the line. They can't hurt you. They can't harm you. Always, always focus on the players on, uh, on the pitch. Um, and 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 I kind of always try to do that, um, um, and always try to focus on that. Um, I, so I was lucky. I always had him to bounce things off. And um, from an early stage, there was a, another man, a very good friend of mine, and a, a very good refereeing colleague of mine at the time, Christy Bradigan. Christy would have been a few years older than me, and had been refereeing a while. So it was always nice to have somebody like him to bounce things off. And as I said, when I met into the League of Ireland, um. Uh, JP Kelly took me under his wing and, 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 and his, his, his advice was you just couldn't put a value on it. So I suppose you have to be mentally strong. Um, I was lucky. I kind of experienced it growing up, throwing the abuse, at, uh, as I said, and, and I, I hold my hands up. Uh, I, and when I think back on it now, it was, it was shocking. Um, and I got the help. I had people there to bounce things off. Um, and, and look at I, football is a passionate game, Dave. You know, even at a junior level, I've seen the toughest of guys at the annual awards of the Kildare District Football League, and they have no disrespect to some of the trophies, but they've this piece of tin in their hands, and oh my God, it's like the World Cup. That's that's their World Cup, and we have to remember that. But we still have to get the balance right. And obviously, as you go up the leagues and into League of Ireland football, there's a different kind of pressure because decisions is the difference between promotion and relegation. The decisions is the difference between European football and you hear figures being bandied about for Rovers or Bows if they get through the next round, if they get through the next round, how much it's worked to the clubs. So different levels of football brings different pressures. Um, yeah, I suppose I was just thick-skinned. Um, had my father got me go to him to guide me through a lot. I had seen what he'd been through. So I, I was kind of half expecting it. I had good people around me. Um, who who you know were there when I needed them, um, and I suppose I was lucky enough in that most of the teams actually thought he's not a bad referee. Um, so I I I, um, I probably didn't get the same level as as other people did. So you know I I probably fluked that where people thought, geez, the little lad's not too bad at all. And um, so yeah, but. I, I go back to the point that I think we do, we need resources, we need more bodies. Anthony is quite right. The Kildare Leach branch, we, we would have had people all the time from the time I joined the branch at League of Ireland level, on the international panel, refereeing the top junior games. But our age profile at branch level is completely wrong now. And that's no disrespect to the guys. They do a fantastic job. Like people must remember, our guys referee school, underage football on a Saturday. And then go out again on a Sunday to do junior football. Um, you know, the, the, the sacrifices and the commitment they make is unbelievable. Um, and some, sometimes, you know, they could be coming from to a second game on a really hot summer's day, you know, that we've had recently or whatever. And let's be fair about it, you know, two games, two games the day before, 
we're all only human, the legs might be there. Um, yeah, look, at we when, when we do the School of Excellence, for instance, we would get in um, guys to talk to guys about mental training and things like that. Uh, we try once a year to get the same kind of talk with the local with the local um, referees uh, to block things out, to not just to block the crowd out, but also to block out, you know, if you think you've made a mistake, because you can't be in that moment because you have to be in the next moment. You can't be in the penalty area thinking, was I right or when it, was I wrong? Because there's something happening in the next penalty area that you... So, you know, I remember my brother asking me once, and this was, again, I suppose it, it's a strong mental attitude. Uh, what did I do when I made a mistake in a game? And um, I said to him, I don't make mistakes in a game. And of course, my brother said, that's very, very arrogant. And I know you're my brother and everything else, but you're not that good. And um, what I explained was for 90 minutes, I had to believe that every decision I made was right. I couldn't afford to start second guessing myself. And that's, that's, I suppose, the mental strength that you have to get into these young referees. You can't afford it because you can't be in that moment where there was a penalty appeal because... 5, 10, 15 seconds there, Anthony's putting in a, a bone crunch and tackle on the halfway line. And that's where my mind, not just my physical being needs to be, but my mind needs to be as well. So for 90 minutes, I have to believe every time I blow my whistle or don't blow my whistle, I'm correct. But I always went home, even in junior football, and replayed the game in my head. Always, always went through the game in my head, the critical decisions looked at, tried to remember where I was, what was my positioning, what was my thinking, could I have got a better view, could I have done something different, and always try and take some learning out of it. And if I was to give a young referee the, the best piece of advice, we're thin not just on referees, but we're thin on coaches and observers. Like we have two observers to cover the whole county of Kildare. Um, and what we try and teach the young referees is to be able to analyse themselves critically in a self-critical manner uh, because there won't always be there somebody there to, from a from an independent point of view. There's always loads of people to, to give you an opinion, but I suppose from an independent point of view, be the referee's observer or referee colleague. So if you can get into a, an ability to be able to self-analyze and be self-critical of your own game and um, to what went well, but more importantly, where you can improve and what you can take into the next game. But yeah, look, at I, I'd love to, to be able to have a, a structure in place that we would have a buddy system or, or, or a coach system for every second or third game that a, a, a young referee went out. Um, but again, that needs to be driven by the referees themselves because as Anthony knows, I would say to, to all clubs, there's my number, ring me if you need me to talk about the laws of the game. I would say the same thing to all referees. If, if something happens in a game and you want to discuss it, give me a call. I, I, I'm always only a phone call away. But yeah, look at... I, I, I hope it's coming across. I, I spent 17 years as a referee. I, I then went in as an observer and a coach and I get great satisfaction out of the School of Excellence and seeing young referees develop to be better, be it at junior level or senior level and, and to help referees in Kildare and all over. I have a passion about refereeing. It was the best thing I ever did. Absolutely. Yes. Won't tell you a lie, Dave or Anthony. We had our bad days. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wouldn't tell you a lie. And I wouldn't tell anyone. I, you know, we all have our bad days. But oh my God. Oh my God. The good days. Yes, there's sacrifices and you'll miss family functions and you'll miss. I never had a holiday for 10 years because all my holidays, all, all the time went for football, be it. European matches or League of Ireland matches or whatever. So I had to take all my time off work to cover those games. But look, if we could just get them through that first year and get a little bit of passion into them about refereeing, oh my God, they would see what a career and what a... And that's even at junior level. Like, you know, don't forget junior referees can referee um, um, in the Aviva Stadium in the FAI Junior Cup. But I believe, I'm not sure if it's you, Dave, or Gary, but Anthony was saying... One of you, Paul Deering, is 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 a relation of one of you. Is it Gary or, or Dave? Yeah, Gary. Gary yeah. Like Paul was a former FIFA assistant referee. But Paul's brother, I think he might be older than him, actually refereed in the Aviva Stadium at an FAI Junior Cup final. So for a junior referee, there's nothing bigger. 
You know, he's in the Avivas. So at any level of football, you can achieve a dream in, in this game. And um, yeah, I, I, we just need to do more to get them over that first season and a half so that Anthony is seeing different faces um, and he's not seeing the same di- faces all the time. Clean on um, the morning, seeing the same lads coming through the gate. Absolutely, Anthony. But look, there's an onus on us all. I, I think, and I go back to that three-legged stool, I think there's an onus on us as referees combined with, with our um, association, the FAI. I think there's an onus working together with the leagues and there's an onus on working together with, with clubs and players. So again, that three-legged stool is, is very important to, to making sure uh, we bring referees through and we keep them because retention is the big problem. You get 17... 18, 20 people on a beginner's course and in 18 months you'd be lucky if you have two, you know, and, and that's what it's about. Um, so yeah, look at, I, I, I wouldn't change a thing there, to be honest. It's, it, it was 17 years of, 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 best 17 years of my life, to be honest. Hey, man, just the final question here yeah. before we wrap it up. You've touched on it a little bit, but uh, just as, say, a young boy or a girl or man or woman that comes to the end of their playing career, what would be your advice of how they should look about maybe getting involved in becoming a referee? Yeah. That down that road? Well, look, at as I said, back when I did it, it was a, a six-week course every Friday night for six weeks in Kevin Street. They've made it even easier now. It's a weekend course. And obviously, during COVID, it's, a, it's, it's online. But the FAI are able to do it, the participants from all over on, on online courses. So it's a weekend course. And basically, you, you learn the laws of the game um, over the weekend. You, you know, you're, you're taught some application, some interpretation. And ultimately, you sit an exam on the laws of the game. Not a very testing exam because ultimately, we're looking to get people into the game. Um, and then obviously... You step out and 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 you do the game, and it's funny with young referees. It, it even little things can help them on their way. I've often gone out to watch referees who who are just starting, and you know, simple little things. As my father used to say to me again, I know I quote them a lot, uh, but he he was brilliant when he was around. Though we go to him, you know, if you can't act the part, at least look the part. You know, so go out, tugged out professionally. Some of the younger kids come out mightn't have the gear, they might have their socks on, go out and look professional. At least when people see you coming out and they go, oh, gee, he's the re- he or she's the referee. And then, look, at if you get involved, Anthony, and you like it, I would recommend uh, if a year or two join the branch because within the branch you get to pick the brains of some of the, the best referees we have in the county and some of them are on the League of Ireland panel. Um, if you show promise and you show an interest and you show a keenness, the next step is is the School of Excellence. And, and that's a two-year program. Now, that's a, that's a commitment um, because it's four weekends for two years. So that's eight weekends. It's a Friday night and all day Saturday. And it's workshops, video shops, um, uh, laws of game tests, vi- uh, fitness tests, video work. We go our, wherever you are in the country, we'll video you. We'll break your game down. and once you graduate from that in two years, you go back to your local league, hopefully a better referee, and hopefully make it to the next level, which is the League of Ireland. And again, the commitment, I suppose that's the biggest thing people meet, is the higher up you go, even at junior level, and then you go to League of Ireland, it's the sacrifice and the time commitment gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, like I suppose at my peak, uh, when I was on the international panel, I was training five days a week, um, you know, and I, I, I was working at the same time, match every Friday night or whatever, uh, four fitness tests a year. Uh, if you fail the fitness test, no games until you pass the next fitness test. Um, and just, just to be clear, the fitness test I was doing was the same fitness test the Premier, guys, Premier League guys were doing in, in England, in Germany, in France, in Italy. It's a FIFA standard test for FIFA officials throughout the world. So it's not because oh, it's part-time football over there. It's a, it's a standard test right across the world. Um, so there is a commitment. Um, but the first thing I'd say is get in. Get the first season under your belt and get to like it. 
Um, and if you like it and you think you want to go further, the, the people in the branch are only too keen to help. There's the, the likes of myself, uh, JP Kelly, Mark Gavin, another former international assistant, always willing to help. So do your beginner's course. As I say, it's a two-day course. Do your exam. Underage football, crying out for referees, um, no different than junior football. But if a young boy or girl around 17 or 18 didn't fancy taking on men, for want of a better expression, in, in junior football, you know, they could always do 13s, 14s and 15s in underage football. Because as I always say, Anthony, offside is offside, be it a 12, 13 or 14, a foul is still a foul at 12, 13 or 14. So they get to the basics and they get to identify, they classify their fouls and, 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 and identify fouls and, and get to apply the laws of the game. But sometimes from a, from a sideline point of view, they can sometimes be the worst touchlines, you know, with, with parents. Um, but hopefully there's been changes there as well. So look at any young boy or girl, um, if, you know, we all want to play. Let's be fair about it. We all want to play. And I suppose one of the worst things that ever happened, uh, refereeing and refereeing recruitment, uh, was over 35 football because that gave guys an opportunity to play the game even longer because that would have been a, a huge resource for refereeing. You know, guys came to 35 and, or 36 and they kind of said, ah, don't, don't want to play anymore, but I might get involved in refereeing or whatever. Um, and obviously now with over 35 football, they can still play. Uh, and I'm only joking when I say, you know, fair play if they want to play on. But it was a bit of a, a resource stealer from us. But um, I, I just can't speak highly enough. I, I'd love the opportunities to go into schools, transition years, colleges, and, and tell people, as I said, you know, at the, at the top of the program, we have a, a lady at the Olympics. She was at the, at the World Championships. She's referee. She's assisted at the European Super Cup. We had Alan Kelly done Champions League matches. We had three, like people concentrated on the teams in Europe, and quite rightly, Bowes, Rovers, Dundalk, etc. But many people not, might not realise, last Thursday night, we had three refereeing teams in Europe. Not one, not two. We had three refereeing teams in Europe. One in Albania, one in Portugal, and one in Iceland. And no coverage. And, you know, that we, as a body, the referees, we have to accept a certain responsibility for that as well. Uh, we have to get that out there. And um, Damien McGrath, as I said, went to the Euros. Uh, top, top assistant, worked with a Scottish referee. Um, you know, top, top assistant, now refereeing uh, in this uh, Premier Division in um, in, in, in League of Ireland, and he he's a a school teacher from Mayo. You know that's how far he went. So the opportunities are brilliant, and we we need to get the message out there. And if you can tell them what's achievable, that first year they might just struggle on because they might see the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. If you know what I mean, um, if they can just get over that that first hurdle. Um, and yes, I'd love to go into schools, colleges, anywhere to talk about refereeing uh, and tell them all about it. Because, as I said, for me, best decision I ever, ever made. Brilliant. No, that's, that's been absolutely brilliant, Martin. Um, we'll just wrap it up there now. So No problem. Um, no, I, on behalf of myself and Anto, I'd like to say that was I really, really enjoyed it. Um, so... As as you were saying, it did. It definitely did come across the passion in it, and uh, hopefully, if, if it you know a few people listening, if it inspires them to to get involved, then happy days. Because as you were saying, it's it's sorely needed. So so fingers crossed that you know it looks better in the future. And and Dave, if if anyone does contact your podcast, Anthony has my contact details. So Anthony, you know, feel free to to pass them on because as Anthony well knows, I. I'm always available to, to, to help people if needed as regards football and, and referee, you know. Brilliant. That's amazing. That's brilliant. Thanks very much. Excellent. Um, and guys, thanks for the opportunity. No, no problem at all. As we were saying, thank, thanks a million. It was an honour to have you on. Um, really, really insightful. So um, I guess we'll wrap it up there, lads. So as we said, thanks a million, Martin, for coming on. And thanks to myself and Anto. And we will see you again very shortly. Thanks for listening. Thanks, guys.